Hey folks, welcome back. So if you're new to my YouTube, welcome. If you're returning back, longtime follower, I'm super happy you're here. Um, if you don't know much about my channel, basically I am obsessed with giant scale electric model aircraft. And I try to only share with you my experiences, not what I think other people have done or how things work. I want you to have success in model aviation, so I try to share my experiences with you. This video is basically going to be um, a more simplistic look at the art at a checklist you could create for your model airplane that can ensure that your airplane is basically airworthy each time. And it, it's just, I love checklists. I, I mean, I'm a full scale pilot too, and you have checklists and real and, and full scale airplanes to make sure all your switches are in the right position, you're doing all your stuff right. But um, being obsessed with giant scale model airplanes like I am, electric ones, 150 inches and bigger. Um, the checklist has given me years and years and years without any uh, crashes or really any scares at all. Before I get too far into this, I want to do a shout out to my sponsor, RTL Fasteners. If you need any bolts, nuts, blind nuts, lock nuts, uh, lock washers, nylocks, any kind of fastener for the hobby, they've probably got it. So go to rtlfasteners.com and if you use the code, super top secret code DA30, you can get 30% off any orders over $50, okay? Really cool company to work with, give them a look. So what I'm gonna do is do something a little bit different this time. I'm gonna talk about full-scale airplanes and then talk about uh, model aircraft. And it could be, any sh could be any size or shape model aircraft, okay? So what I've done was I put together a little video here, and, and I have this service I belong to where I get uh, royalty free videos from and I've got tens of thousands of videos I can go to so what I'm gonna do here is when you fly a full-scale airplane okay your ass is on the line because you're gonna get in that airplane and leave the ground so the moment you pull the airplane out of storage or your hangar or untie it from the ground you go through a checklist looking at the airplane uh, you're looking in the cowl for maybe if a bird built a nest you see any oil dripping, you see anything cracked, you look at all your flying surfaces, make sure that their hinges are tight, um, there's not a lot of wiggle in them. You, you basically, as you walk around the airplane, you're gonna know there's certain things that you visually, and you also physically check, okay? And, and that's one of the things I wanna really try to drive through is some of our model airplanes are not complicated at all, and some of them are very complicated. Full-scale airplanes are the same thing. There are some full-scale airplanes that aren't complicated, others that are real complicated. Um, keep in mind, planes don't crash coming down normally. You crash going up. You don't crash into the sky, you crash into the ground. So once you're airborne in a real airplane, your ass is on the line. And the thing is, is that when you fly full-scale, um, there are even people that screw up the checklist or they screw up their maintenance or they they don't follow some basic things and then you read about it in an NTSB report and when you read that report you're like how could anybody have ever done that with an airplane um, B-17 is an example and this isn't the one that crashed but there was a B-17 a couple of years back that crashed killed a couple of people a couple of people survived it was one of those ones that take you up for a ride but when the NTSB got done with it the plane should have never been flying. The maintenance shows that the magnetos were in bad condition, the spark plug gaps were in bad condition. There was so much wrong with that plane, it shouldn't have been flying. But during the pre-flight, they found all kinds of problems with the engines where they didn't want to run right. Um, uh, it's been reported that they used like uh, heat guns and blow dryers to try to blow out water from uh, some of the magnetos on the plane. So if people are gonna be that, uh, how do I say this? I don't like to use negative words like stupid and idiots and dumbasses. But if people are going to be um, that brazen, that they don't understand the safety of other people's lives, how do we create an environment where we look at our model airplanes and think about that? Okay? And I, I know I know, riding in a, uh, a real airplane, you, if you're getting in it, you're basically trusting whoever's done the pre-flight they've done a good job if you fly commercially and you see the pilot walk around the airplane outside the window they're visually looking for oil dripping or fuel leaking they're visually looking for something wrong but in a modern commercial plane when they get in it and they go to fire up the airplane 
there's all kinds of sensors that can tell them if there's something wrong with that airplane. In a model airplane, there aren't any sensors to tell us if the hydraulic pressure is low, or which we don't have hydraulic on model airplanes, but that's not a great example. But we don't like have sensors on our batteries telling us if the internal resistance is bad. We don't have sensors on our batteries showing that if one cell is really out of balance once we've put it in the airplane. Now you can put your little tester in there and see it, but most of the time when we fly model airplanes, we just, I mean, most people just don't give a crap. But what I want you to think about is um, my MSL-1, every time I'd go fly it, I had a checklist for it. And I ended up with over 1,350 flights on this airplane. I have a checklist for my MSL-2. I have about 145 flights on it. But let's talk about any model airplane for a minute, okay? So I'm going to use um, this. Imagine that this is a 40 size glow or 40 size electric biplane. You're going to realize in your checklist that I always check my propeller. The, re the reason I do that is I've actually had a couple of props. Keep in mind, I've been doing this since the very late 70s. I've had a couple of props come apart in the air. Now, most every time it was a wooden propeller. I've never had a carbon fiber or a composite propeller explode on me. But I've had wooden blades lose like the outside. Basically, you get a crack in the grain and you don't see it and you lose the propeller. So I, I always look at my propellers first and or propeller, propellers or blades or whatever, if it's multi-engine both. But I, I visually look at that and then I go to the engine and I actually grab the propeller and move it make sure the engine's not loose. Then I make sure the fuel I'm going to use is either clean and the right kind. Um, and the reason I say that is I had a two-stroke engine one time that when I filled up the gas can, I forgot to put in the oil. And I flew the engine. The engine kept losing RPM as I really went to full power. Luckily, I didn't destroy the engine, but basically I seized the engine up. As it heated up, it swelled up and got tight, and I almost crashed the plane. Um, if you're flying an electric... Or is the battery healthy? I've done umpteen videos on internal resistance and the, the health of your lipo. Um, then you think about the wings. Are the wings tight? Are they bolted on? Okay. Now keep in mind, in my other video I shared, there's an AMA document, 520-A, that for my big giant scale planes, over 55 pounds, there's already kind of a set checklist that you look at. I'm trying to simplify that right now. Okay. So wings, tight. If it's a biplane like this, is the rigging functional? You got to check the rigging. Um, flying surfaces. I always pull on my ailerons a little bit. Okay, I'll grab them and gently I'll move them up and down and I'll listen to that servo. Do I hear that servo grinding or, or making noises like one of the teeth or the servo's blown up? But make sure that aileron's tight. Um, I saw a friend of mine come out of a dive one time and heard a real quick zzzz. And when his ailerons fluttered, one pulled right out of the hinges and was hanging on the control horn, he landed. But when we looked at those uh, three robot hinges, he had never glued them in. He had just pushed them tight into that wood and forgot to glue them in. So that shows you how good the hinge was pushing into that balsa wood. But the right aileron was never glued in. Um, and then you want to, and, and like I said, you want to look at those hinges. You got to make sure everything's working right. Um... On your tail, is it tight? Do you bolt on the horizontal stabilizer each time you fly it? Is If it's a bolt-on, does it stay tight? Has it gotten loose? Then you want to take your check the elevator and rudder in those hinges. Okay? Um, and the landing gear. If it's got wheels, do the wheels turn and are they on tight? Is the landing gear struts getting loose? The Goldberg Chipmunk was notorious because it had landing gear... Uh, steel wire that was bent and then went up and then it would, it would slide into hardwood blocks and it had two little plastic straps on it. But that wood would wear over time and those gears would start to flex. I hope that makes sense that, you know, imagine cat kind of having this shape come up over and up. This went into the wood, but as the wood would wear, that landing gear would start to get slop. Um, make sure that that's tight and it's not going to fall off or or bend back or, or the or the hardwood blocks not cracking and splitting inside and then you need to think about your flight pack for your receiver or I'm sorry your receiver battery not your flight pack but your receiver battery is it a healthy battery is it charged 
um, flight pack, if it's a LiPo, is it balanced and is the internal resistance good? Now look, I've, I've done the internal resistant video a couple of times and I've had people remark on it without watching the video. And that's a little pet peeve of mine. If you're gonna remark on one of my videos, watch the whole video. Because one of the things I point out is certain airplanes that pull a lot of amps you got to make sure your voltage doesn't drop under those amps. With bad internal resistance, your voltage will drop very quickly. But that might not matter on a park flyer, and that might not matter on a glider, like a, a powered glider. But if you've got a big half-scale airplane like I fly that's pulling 6,000 watts, you need to have low internal resistance. Okay? Um, and then you need to... <laughs> I know this sounds simple, but you need to make sure your radio is set up and your radio is programmed right. And your radio is working. Um, and then do the control checks. You know, move your sticks around. Make sure all the things are moving in the right direction and all of that. And then make sure your motor goes to full power and all of that. So that's the basic checklist for that. I know that sounds like a lot. But you can go through this checklist literally in five minutes each time you get to the field. Now, I don't, ha I don't do this each flight. I do this when I get to the field and get set up. And then if I let the plane sit overnight, I do it again. But I haven't abbreviated this, I do for every flight. Are the batteries good? Is my motor still tight? I'll move my propeller and stuff around just about every flight to make sure nothing's coming apart. So you can create an abbrevi abbreviated before flight checklist. So I call one checklist before flying for the whole day and then before flight, okay? Now, this is basically the same exact checklist right here, okay, except you might have Things like your landing gear, if they're retractable, does it have the air working? If they're electric, are they working? Um, so the more complex an airplane gets, if you got flaps, are the flaps working? Are they both coming down together? So you will have a, a different checklist for this than you would a very simple biplane or a simple trainer. But that trainer you take to the field, you should still have a checklist for it. Keep in mind, my 55 pound or more airplanes fly about 45 or 50 mile an hour and if they hit you they could kill you but a 12 pound edf going 135 mile an hour can kill you just as fast or more quickly than my big floaty 60 pound airplane that's flying 45 mile an hour i would if somebody says what do you want to be hit by dag i'd rather be hit by one of my planes going 45 mile an hour than an EDF doing like 100, you know, buck 20, uh, 25 that weighs 12 pounds any day. But then you want to talk about complexity. So imagine this is, and I'm building a big, huge version of this if you've been following my video, but this A7 here can have spoilers. It can have leading edge devices. It can have the flaps, the aileron. This can have so many systems that that checklist is getting very critical. If you have one leading edge droop versus the other one, that could be a bad day. If you got spoilers that aren't working right, if you got, there's just all kinds of things, but keep in mind in that video I showed at the beginning, when that person opened the hangar to pull the airplane out, that hangar has sat, I'm sorry, that airplane sat in that hangar for a day, a week, a month without that person knowing what's going on with their airplane. Sometimes airplanes just sitting still can break. You know, I, I met a man uh, who used to do maintenance on B-36s, and he says you could take one out of maintenance and it would sit on the runway and just break. Our model aircraft, though, bounce around the back of our trucks, the back of our trailers, the back of our trunks. They bounce around, and sometimes our airplanes are subjected to worse forces bouncing around the back of our vans and our trucks than actually flying the airplane on and off grass. So even though the last time you flew that airplane and it flew really nice and you had that perfect greased on landing, you could have damaged the airplane in your car or sitting at home. You know, you, you could have. I actually blew out a nose gear uh, steering servo at home because I was trying to twist the airplane and get it into a certain place on my workbench. And I didn't know I damaged the servo until I went out to the field the next day and went to move the nose gear. And the nose gear's not working. Then I realized the servo had turned 180 degrees and when I fired it up, I had actually stripped it. Now, this was a cheap servo, and I quit using servos like that 30 years ago. But that was me that caused that problem, okay? But when we talk about complexity, if you followed my builds, you know my C-130 um, had so many servos and so many systems in it. I was more scared of it being a maintenance hog. But how do you find out you've got a maintenance problem? 
It's from your pre-flight checklist. I'm telling you, I have found so many things that have broken on my airplanes doing that pre-flight before getting the airplane into the air. Okay, so real quickly, just I mentioned earlier that AMA document uh, 520-A, inside it is a checklist that we go through um, every time we fly our over 55 pound airplanes. And believe it or not, I still pull this out and go through it on the airplane and just make what is ever applicable here, I go through it on my airplane. There's four sheets to this and it ensures my plane is gonna fly safe. But, and, I, and if you know, I love to do my 3D stuff. So um, here is a DC-3 and it's a massive one. So let's say that you've made this extremely simplistic, okay? It's got front windows, but everything else is painted. The other windows are fake. Basically, this is a big floaty balsa wood airplane. Twin engines, landing gear, simple flaps, you can have a trainer with the same systems on this, except for being two engines, as this airplane could be complicated. Or you could deck this out with a bazillion rivets. You could make this a lead sled. And that's where you'll really be hurting if something goes wrong. So let's say you don't have a pre-flight checklist. Let's say that you've gone out and you've gotten this thing fired up. You throw in batteries. One battery is a piece of garbage, steaming turd. The other battery is brand new, and you're excited that you bought a brand new battery. You do the run-up, and you see both engines spin up, and you're like, I'm ready to go. You get this lead sled in the air, and that internal resistance starts to dive on that one battery. And we all think that we are Top Gun Tom Cruise, and we can fly model airplanes on one engine. Um, and everybody I've ever met, except for one or two people, say that, they're very hard to fly on one engine. I've never had a good multi-engine airplane, glow or electric, that flies great on one engine. Okay, the air molecules and everything are different on the size of the rudder and everything. But let's say you destroy your, your prized possession, okay? Or let's say it's a gasser and you put in gas in both engines, um, but you just filled up your fuel tank and you get dirt in it. Who knows what happens? When the plane's in the air is not when you want to find out there's a problem. Okay, you want to find it on the ground. There was actually an accident of a big B-29 once where in their pre-flight they didn't see that one of the servos was not moving the throttle, I think on the number four engine or whatever engine it was, and they crashed that plane. Um, a simple pre-flight of actually running it up and ensuring the RPM of all the engines is really important, okay? So I'm not trying to scare you because we all are going to fly our airplanes. We're all going to have all of our different types of airplanes. But the bottom line is once an airplane's in the air is not when you want to find out you got a problem. And by having a simple checklist and on a, on a trainer, it could just be props good, spinners tight, motors not loose, landing gears tight, all the control surfaces, hinges are tight, they all move right, the wings got enough rubber bands, um, and you're ready to fly. Because look, folks, I knock on wood, I have gone like 15 years without a crash. Um, now I've had maintenance problems, but I find those on the ground because of my checklist. And in model aviation right now, we got everybody in the world watching us, so we don't want to have a publicized crash that makes it on the news. I don't know how to stress how important a pre-flight checklist really is because of everything that's going on in our airplanes. Okay, and I guarantee you, if you're going to get in one of these and fly it, you would really be meticulous. I mean, like my ultralight I'm building, it's a single seat ultralight, um, 35 horsepower motor. I'm going to pre-flight the hell out of that thing because it's got a lot of drag. It doesn't have a great glide ratio. If that engine dies in the air, I'm pretty much going to be landing right below me. And because it's draggy, I'm going to have to really be put the nose down, keep the airspeed up to land it. Okay, and there's model airplanes that are like that, that they are draggy pigs. They don't have great glide ratios. So uh, that's it, everybody. So as I always end my videos, please get youth involved in model aviation. Find a kid six years old up, get them a glide, balsa glider or a balsa rubber powered airplane. Get them involved in aviation away from the killer video games where they go into a park and just start running a 68 Camaro over people's bodies and killing them. Model aviation will prevent mass murders if you get kids into it at an early age. 
So that's it, everybody. I hope you find this video beneficial. If you did, please like and subscribe. I'm trying to build my YouTube, and it's also getting to the point that it's actually starting to pay for my hobby. And that's the whole reason for my YouTube is to get information out to you that you can use and you find useful, but also to help pay for my hobby. Because um, I've got a daughter I'm sending to college, folks. So have an awesome day, and thanks for all the positive responses I get. Rock on, and I'll see you next time. Be safe. Bye-bye.